So as we conclude this, uh, this very intense week of a tremendous amount of learning, uh, we hope at least a tremendous amount of learning, and certainly a tremendous amount of learning and hope for all of us, um, we wanted to use this space as an opportunity to digest, to process, uh, to raise questions that may have been surfacing in recurring ways throughout the week, both to respond to some of the classes that were uh, here on the stage, classes and events that took place in the courtyard, um, as well as events in modern Israel that um, either were referenced and we want to expand on or that we didn't get to in the context of our lectures. Um, and to, to hear from uh, my colleagues who are the, the members of the I Engage a research team who were responsible for curating and designing this content as well as the, the content that we teach around uh, North America and many platforms around about, um, to respond also both personally uh, and, and intellectually around, uh, around all of these issues and, and to try to see whether we can, again, without wrapping things up, see whether there are takeaways of things that we want to take home. I thought I would start with one or two questions and then we'll use the bulk of the time to open it up. And I do want to ask, um, as was alluded to at the beginning, we'd really like to hear questions from folks who have perhaps not asked a question in the Beit Midrash uh, first. I'm going to give the, the, that privilege first to folks who we haven't heard from before, and to try to use this space more for, for actually asking questions. Um, I think we, there, I know people have very, very strong opinions about a lot of these issues, but this is a, a continued space for, for that kind of learning. Now the first, uh, first question I wanted to, to raise was that, you know, while we're here and having, uh, having these conversations about 67, there was a major um, news event in the last couple of days as it relates to one of the legacies of 67, which is the Kotel. And, um, and we debated internally, should we, should we do something about this? Should we change the program? We decided not to and decided to use this space as an opportunity to reflect a little bit on that issue. Now, part of the reason why it's particularly uh, it's particularly important and particularly challenging to talk about this is that one of the obviously one of the consequences of, as we talked about in some of our learning of the Six Day War was in terms of Jerusalem, the, re the reacquainting of the Jewish people with the Kotel, the language that it was Daniel I think used around the, the Kotel as a place of in theory peoplehood um, and in practice prayer. And the clash between those stories of peoplehood and prayer as they're interpreted by different Jews. So the splashy news was the government of Israel deciding to no longer hold itself to the agreement that had been made. And, um, and some sort of emerging chaos about what happens to the status quo with respect to the Robinson's Arch space for egalitarian prayer and what the long-term prognosis is for, uh, for liberal Jews um, uh, in, in Israel as well as diaspora Jews who feel connected to that place. And for the first time, at least that I can remember, the language that came from American Jewish leaders towards Israeli government officials um, was much sharper and harsher about the change in the status quo than on virtually any other issue I'd seen before. So this is all happening in real time. And one of the first question, which is not really a question, but just an opportunity for reflection, is how are whoever wants to respond, thinking about this, responding to this, um, what additional questions do you think it raises for us and, and can you draw some connections between the learning that we were trying to do here around the consequences of the Six Day War to, to what can or should be the way in which this Kotel issue is resolved? If you could just read your articles, the two of you, aloud. Just read them aloud. Just read them aloud read and them aloud. go back to my first lecture and uh, note what you see here you see the vacuum that I was speaking about on the opening night. You see what happens when a group of people who are so, it was a great idea. It was high tech. But we don't feel comfortable wearing this. <laughs> Like it's just not us. It just it's, it's it's somebody else. It just doesn't maybe. Um, no, you. What does it mean to have a country that's so central to who you are, but you are completely dis feel that you're disempowered? This is it. So and so and part of it is that some Israelis say so leave. <laughs> it's like. 
they don't so leave and they think that your connection that that do they need you for BDS or not so okay one second if we're, we might have 25 years where until right wing let's say orthodoxy has enough Jews to be powerful enough could Christian evangelists and evangelicals get us through and if they can then we can forget about you we don't need you you're the phone meme anyway. <laughs> you're leaving, you're dying, you're disappearing, you're, I don't know what you've done. All the, all the above. There isn't an understanding of that your connection to Israel is because you love this place. Your connection is because this is part of the way you do Jewish. It's not a functional coalition. It's not that you're here because, or, or if we give you A, you'll, you'll give us B. It's, it's, it, it comes at another place. And, and that's the deepest insult. The, deep, the problem is not with the Haredi parties. They don't understand. Haredi Judaism has, for the last 200 years, felt that the fundamental danger to Judaism is you. This has been for 200 years. That anybody who is willing to integrate modernity, whether through orthodoxy, conservative reform, that the integration of modernity into Judaism will bring about the destruction of Judaism. That this, this has nothing to do with the Kotel. This is at the DNA of, of ultra-orthodoxy. When the Chatan Sofer of Moshe Schreiber in the, in, in the 20s of the 19th century says, Chadash Asur Torah, whatever is new is forbidden under Jewish law. And he founds the ultra-orthodoxy. And every, you all knew is something good. So he hates that they've, been, they've grown up that you are the danger. The problem is, is the other 90% of Israeli society who doesn't really understand what Israel means for the rest of world Jewry. And we have a very long way to go. Because as long as, as I wrote, as long as the place at the Kotel is either taxes or ransom, which they have to pay you, nobody wants to pay ransom and everybody wants to pay the least amount of taxes as possible. Instead of seeing, instead of Israelis seeing themselves as the sovereign over something that's bigger than them, and instead of seeing themselves as having for themselves a need at the Kotel, why don't I, since they, that vacuum hasn't yet been filled. And as long as it's not filled, it's not the Kotel which is going to create the problem. It's that there isn't in Israel that too many Jews around the world <coughs> could feel that they could develop a partnership with. And these moments come forth. And um, I am pained for your pain. I am pained because Israelis don't understand. There's this article today, and I would this, and there was this article today in the um, um, NRG, Ma'ariv uh, um, website. And it was taken out by a group of people who a few months ago were attacking us, and they just go around and attack. And what they basically do is they succeed in shifting the debate from the issue to ad hominem attacks. So this is a whole expose on Rick Jacobs. This is in Main Street. Rick Jacobs is the problem. It's not the Kotel which is the problem. You know Rick Jacobs there in New York. He's the problem. Rick Jacobs is on the New Israel Fund board. They did the same thing. The same thing that they did. He's on the New Israel Fund. He told Netanyahu not to speak in, um, in front of the Congress. He supported Clinton over what we Israelis see as our friend. This was, he has a whole, they gave a list of sins, and by listing the sins of Rick Jacobs, the idea is don't deal with the substance of the issue. How do we create within Israel the, 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 a, 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 a society which understands their needs for a diverse and pluralistic Judaism? and a society which could see you the way you see yourself is going to determine to what extent we might get over this Kotel or not. But whether in the long run, this idea of one Jewish people, a 
um, is tenable in any serious way. Um, so, uh, so, so I, I had a similar question in mind uh, when thinking about this. The question of what happens when you, when you have a dream, right? A Zionist dream. Uh, and you come to Israel and it's not what you think it should be. Uh, and that's the question I think that so many American Jews have. Uh, so much of our American Jewish community and identity is based around Israel, engagement for Israel, support of Israel, loving Israel, uh, you know, complex interaction with Israel. And then coming here and not getting recognition, it is so painful. And I'll share here, if it's okay, uh, some other instances where I've, I've been having this question and something that inspired me. Um, when, when I arrived about a week, a week ago was it? A uh, week, I don't know. When I arrived to Israel, um, uh, it was, I, I had a little bit of a, of a diff difficult time. Um, the weeks before I had been reading a lot of articles uh, that came out mostly in the Israeli press about what they call here Parashat Yal Deteman, which is just um, uh, what happened with a lot of Yemenite children uh, when they moved to, to Israel and you know, just like a lot of children disappeared and kidnappings and just a lot of difficulties. Um, and I've been speaking with different activists, uh, trying to understand what do they make of this, because this was their Zionist dream, right? They had dreamed of Zion, they thought they would fly and can finish Arim in the, uh, find in the wings of eagles and come here, and they came here and the dream was shattered. Um, and I spoke to, to one activist who, uh, and I asked him, what do you do right now with the Zionist dream, right? With disappointment. And he told me, no, uh, I'm not going to let them, the people who were responsible for this, co-opt what it means to be a Zionist. He said, we were the Zionists, we are the Zionists, I'm not going to let them take this away from me, I'm going to differentiate between what I believe is the real premise of Zionism and the people who are behaving in a way that doesn't live up to this. So that, that inspires me and I'm thinking a lot about this, I'm still processing this. I'm processing uh, the words of um, Rabbi David Buzaglo, who was a Paitan, uh, uh, I'm, a poet uh, from Morocco who spoke about the need to hold um, geula, redemption, and catastrophe at the same time in hand and not let them take away from each other. Uh, and kind of, I think, what, what Yehuda was mentioning, the challenges, the exodus politics of getting into the promised land. And the question that I'm taking with, the, with me, thinking about the Kotel, uh, is what happens to a Zionist dream that we hold so dear and when, when there's challenges in it? And how, how do we make sure, I'll speak for myself, how do I make sure that I don't let the people who I think are corrupting my version of the Zionist dream be able to co-opt what that dream uh, should mean for me and for people that I care about. So uh, the first thing I'm thinking about is just empathy. Um, I like going to the Kotel. I like praying at the Kotel. It's a spiritual place for me. I cannot imagine uh, wanting to pray the way that you pray at the Kotel and not being able to do it. That's just baseline, it's, it's horrifying. The second thing I'm thinking about when I start to really analyze is I start to think about what do you have to do, what can you do through education? What can you accomplish through education and what do you have to do through force? And when I think about a society as diverse as Israel's, I realize that there are some things that Israel is gonna need to do through education, ultra-Orthodox in the army maybe, and some things they're gonna need to do through force. And what became very clear to me is that if the government of Israel wanted to do this and have an egalitarian prayer space at the main, uh, at a visible spot at the Kotel, it would have to be through force. And if you're gonna marshal force, then there are a lot of politics at play, and then you start making pragmatic decisions. There's no idealistic way to think about this. And that is really a wall for me because I really believe in education, and I really believe that this is not an educational or educable moment. I think it's about force, I think it's about politics, and I think it's a good thing that the American Jewish community is trying to exert its force in this regard, in whatever limited manner it chooses to do so. The third thing I think about is uh, where I come from. A few years ago, on this stage, somebody said, what would you like to see changed about Israel? And I said, it's ridiculous to quote oneself, but I am doing that. <laughs> I say, and also when I hear other people quote themselves, I say, I'm never gonna do that, and now I just did it. That's, it's very meta. This is very meta. I appreciate you all being part of this moment. I hope, I hope someone here is writing this down. So a few years ago, when I was asked the question, 
what would I change about Israeli society? I said the way that religion is coerced in Israeli society. And I said that given where I come from, uh, that is not an easy thing for me to stay on the stage, even though that is taken for granted in these halls um, of religious pluralism. Somebody came up to me afterwards and said, great, would you like to join a coalition that's about actually changing that because we need more orthodox participants? And I said, no, 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 no. That is political suicide for me. I'm not doing that. No, 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 no. It's great, and somebody else can do it, but I'm not doing it. I went out on my limb, I said something on camera, I'm done. And I thought about it for two years, and then you know what happened? In response to this Kotel decision, there were two prominent rabbinic organizations, both orthodox, both of which I am a part, the International Rabbinic Fellowship in the United States, based in the United States, and Beit Hillel, which is co-ed as well, based here, who came out with very strong statements against this backtracking on the Kotel. What that says to me is not rah, 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 go Orthodox community. What that says is that you have allies. And let's use those alliances, because it's not going to take a short time. And you need allies in Israeli society, and you have them. So let's use them. One of the very painful consequences for me of the Kotel controversy is that it has obscured what for me is really the essence of the Kotel experience, which is not national and it's not peoplehood, it's very personal. It's where I go to meditate, it's where I go to try to experience something of the Shekhinah, the divine presence. I take very seriously the notion that there is a concentration of divinity at the wall. And what that means is that when we turn the wall into a political football, we are violating something essential about who we are. So in a way, I have a paradox that I'm struggling with which is that for me, the core of my Kotel experience is not peoplehood, it's religious. And yet, because the Kotel has become the national unifying, in principle, unifying uh, expression of our peoplehood, I have to relate to that, that aspect seriously. So that's, that's the first paradox, and I don't really know what to do with that. The second paradox is that I stand with the liberal denominations on this issue, but not for liberal reasons. In fact, I don't define myself as a liberal, not politically, not religiously. I don't believe that being a voter of the Democratic Party is, is, is essential to one's Jewishness. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and so, I stand with the liberal denominations because of my commitment not to religious pluralism, but to Jewish peoplehood. And that means that, that I, I, again, I, I find myself uh, constantly in different camps with allies who are not allies for me in other issues. And, uh, and that's a very lonely place but it's the only place that I know where I can maintain my integrity as a Jew. And so um, this issue has profoundly disoriented me, and I think that that, in some sense, is the right response. All right, let me up the ante. Um, one of the, so it's interesting and, um, and telling to see the vociferousness of this response around the Kotel. Things like the head of the Jewish agency criticizing the government for the first time that people can remember in this type of way. The voices of American Jewish leaders, sometimes in Israeli media, although part of the problem is that they're not oftentimes in Israeli media except in the English-speaking media. Um, and there is a, there has been even the use of terms like economic leverage that American, Jewish, American Jews have, which certainly pertains to the Kotel, but, um, but is, is a larger kind of threat of a recognition that between philanthropy and advocacy and lobbying, American Jews have leverage here to see their, um, their issues played out. But there's an implicit, sometimes explicit line 
uh, distinction of you're allowed to exercise your economic leverage when it comes to religion and state issues, but you are not allowed, um, according to the communal rules, to exercise your economic leverage as it relates to uh, political issues, especially dissidents around the occupation. That is a, that's the rule, and therefore you, you will see prominent Jewish leaders publicly speaking out against the Israeli government when it comes to religion and state issues and violating that uh, that it turns out there isn't a rule that you're allowed you're not allowed to criticize the Israeli government even if you don't live here you're allowed to but only on issue X um, but not on the occupation on other security issues on the Iran deal and so forth um, I, I guess I'm curious whether you agree with that line whether you th and, and also just whether you think it can hold long term uh, given the political diversity in the Jewish community in America, given the growing frustrations that we've talked about this week of 50 years since the Six Day War, is it a line that should be in place? Um, and is it a line that you think can hold, given all of that language of peoplehood and pluralism that we've been talking about this week? I'm going to start with you. I draw a distinction between criticism, including public criticism, and boycotts of any form. Uh, criticism is an essential part of our conversation. It isn't just a right, it's a responsibility on any and every issue. And that includes criticizing Israel during war, if, if diaspora Jews feel we deserve it, and that is uh, extremely painful for me as an Israeli. It's painful for me as a father of a soldier. It's simply in a... a uh, emotionally, it violates all my red lines. Intellectually, I uphold that principle as, as an essential part of our relationship. In terms of boycotts, I think that if we become a people that resorts to boycott whenever uh, one group or another is offended by what another group or, or the government does, we will become a, a completely dysfunctional people. In fact, we won't be a people anymore. A people doesn't speak to itself in the language of boycotts. What I would like to see as a response to the Kotel issue is not American Jews withdrawing from Israel, but quite the opposite. I would like to see tens of thousands of American Jews coming in the next year going to the main plaza in the wall and, and praying. That's, that's, that's a response. And the question is, and, and this is really an open question, it's a challenge that this issue has presented to American Jews, is how serious are American Jews about this issue? Does the Kotel really belong to you? If so, then show it. What did you say you wanted to do? Do what? Raise the, the ante. OK, um, I want to raise the ante. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to being misunderstood. <laughs> because that's the nature of life. And it's going to be on video, so you can watch it again. I agree with everything that Yossi said. No but. That's not raising the ante. Wait. <laughs> It's not a but, it's an and. We're boycotting each other all the time. Israel's boycotting you. What do you think Israel's doing right now? Israel's boycotting you. Within Israeli society, we boycott each other all the time. All the time. I won't sit with you. The Haredim boycott Yair Lapid. I won't sit in your cabinet. I won't sit with you. This notion that we have this functioning, beautiful Am Yisrael who is not crossing a line, that's the Am Yisrael that I would like to have. We don't have that. And so the question is, how do we function in this environment? The problem we face is that there's nothing inherently wrong with boycotting. You do it all the time. Economic boycotting done all the time. The problem is that this medium has been controlled now by a group of people who the minute you cross that line, boycotting is in essence to undermine with all of the language which people say, no, I'm just boycotting this or that. More often than not, boycott is a tool to undermine the legitimacy of Israel and not to argue against a policy. And consequently, we find ourselves, and you in particular, and by the way, it's me too, 
because I live, I'm both, I live three months in America, but this institution, we live in both places. We find ourselves seriously inhibited because a tool to express profound anger has been taken away from us. Because boycott is now, it's, to, it's, to, it's, it's not settlements, it's not occupation, it's 47. We know that's what it is. Now, why is it even more difficult? Because the Jewish people today are a profoundly divided tribal people, particularly even in general. And, and if we talk about Israel, in Israel in particular, if you want to have an impact on Israel, the president speaks of four tribes. I wish there were four tribes. I'm up to 23 now when I count. 23 different tribes. Each one thinking and acting in a tribal manner and saying, who do I represent? And how do I look out for the interests of who I represent? And unless you speak in that language in Israel, you don't exist. So I don't disagree with Yossi at all, but I find ourselves in a catch-22. I truly do. If I do this, if, if I continue to, to, okay, so we canceled the meeting with Netanyahu. I'm sure he and Sarah are just couldn't sleep that night. <laughs> you know, ach, and vel, he just couldn't sleep. The meeting was canceled. <gasps> Boy, what am I going to do with my extra hour instead of speaking in front of the Jewish agency that day? I think somehow he might get over it. And he also knows all he needs, and not he, and it's not in a cynical sense, all that's needed is a little flare up in Gaza and the whole thing is yesterday's conversation. Not that he would, but he knows. And the one thing you know in the Middle East is there gonna be another flare, there is gonna be another flare up in Gaza. And there is gonna be an attack and there is gonna be a stabbing and there is gonna be someone kidnapped. It's down the road, unfortunately. It's what we live with all the time. And so he says, okay, you'll be back. So now I wasn't invited, I'll be invited. I have to what? Where's the next GA? LA. I have, in LA, I have three months. What'll happen in three months? Or maybe I'll just do, and you know, it might last a little longer. Because as long as North American Jewry does not find a way to act like a tribe, it's gonna be ignored. It's going to be ignored. Now, not meeting, what I think we need to, and here I don't have an answer to it, but this is something that I wanna think about. Are, is, is boycott a general category for any time you do anything beyond verbal criticism? This is where I'll put my butt. I agree with you, but if everything beyond verbal criticism constitutes boycott, you are robbing world jewelry of nuanced conversation which all of us use all the time towards each other. And then consequently, you're destining world jewelry to a voice that can't be heard. I think we need to find more variables, other ways. How do I not just say something? How do I do something? And doing something is not only in the positive of flooding the Kotel, even though, by the way, that would be help. But there has to be a way to say, you've, you've boycotted me. You have boycotted me. And therefore, I need something. And what I would recommend, and I'm going to participate in this, is that different organizations, leadership of different organizations, have to find a way to talk or do something which clearly distinguishes ourselves from the BDS movement, which I want to have no part of, nor will I have any part of, both personally or institutionally, no part in whatsoever. But still, we need something more than just writing an article in the Times of Israel. That's just not going to do it. Just, uh, just want to respond for one moment. I think you've offered a really important response to Yehuda in terms of a distinction of where we boycott and where we don't. Any boycott that contributes, even in the most indirect way, to the BDS movement, which is to say any boycott that touches on the issue of occupation, is pasul, is, is 
is, is forbidden. Uh, and any boycott that, that has to do with our internal dynamics uh, is, uh, is kosher. Sure, so I'll bring here, I think, uh, Ilana's earlier distinction between education and force. Uh, and I'm thinking that we have to distinguish between the battle right now and the long-term war uh, of trying to find recognition and space for multiple kinds of Judaisms and Jewish people within Israel. So to me, actually thinking not only in terms of how to respond to this uh, current uh, decision, but thinking more long-term about the sort of efforts that would actually educate uh, Israelis about American Jews is really crucial. We invest so much on birthright and encounters in which we take uh, you know, American Jews to expose them to Israel, but if you speak to most, I don't know, I don't want to generalize, but if, if when I speak, when I speak to a lot of Israelis or most Israelis, um, they, they don't really understand American Judaism. They don't, they, they, they take the word uh, reform, and by the way, if you read Facebook comments by Israelis, they don't say reform and conservative, they say reform, because it's become a little bit of a label for something they don't actually know and they don't understand, but they think that they're not like them. So, so to me, we have to think very thoughtfully about the sort of effort that will, in the long run, uh, educate, bring more exposure, more understanding, and have the sort of encounter in which Israeli Jews would actually understand uh, the, the integrity, uh, the passion, dedication, and commitment that so many uh, non-Orthodox, and even Orthodox Jews, not all of them like praying in the world the way that it is right now, um, feel, uh, and, and how important uh, prayer is for people who aren't Orthodox outside of Israel, right? How important the Kotel can be, which is not the same conversation that it has right now uh, in the Israeli pub public square. So that to me is important to speak not only about the current moment, force, boycotts, whatever you're considering, but what's our long-term strategy? Um, I agree with most of what was said, I think. But I would just add that I think there's a big difference in terms of who's principally impacted in the two different cases. I think that when we're talking about boycotts, about occupation, the people who are principally impacted are not American Jews. Um, I understand that there's an element of impact in terms of the way people look at us um, and are being complicit in certain ways. But here, this is an affront to American Jews. The people who are actually impacted are American Jews, first and foremost. And I, I think that that's an important distinction um, to put into this conversation. And I also think an important distinction is what kind of boycott or use of force? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to undermine security? Are you trying to ask questions about security? Or are you just trying to get a coalition across different religious perspectives? I think those are different. I'll just use my privilege as a moderator to now designate myself as a panelist. Um, <laughs> only in order to be able to, to register my disagreement with you, Yassi, that um, I don't, although I, I share with you a lot of um, a lot of the critique around the particulars of the BDS movement as it's constructed, and although I have a very strong um, set of disagreements around the, 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 the BDS as a strategy, just to one to example of to one effect, if you ask the wine store owner in the kosher in the wine store in Riverdale, which is like one of the best kosher wine stores anywhere, um, if you ask him about wine from the West Bank, he'll say to you, do you want to buy wine from the West Bank or are you boycotting wine from the West Bank? <laughs> and in other words, it has essentially become, when it comes to the kosher wine industry, it's become essentially neutral, given the fact that the response by certain communities has been to only buy wine from the West Bank. So at this point, I'm not sure what the effectiveness of the strategy is. Um, and as in part, but in part because of my skepticism about the effectiveness of the strategy, um, I would like to push away from the language of pasul, uh, the language of nullification. Um, I think I think it is too easy to allow political strategies to become designated um, because of guilt by association with people who you don't like associated with that strategies. Um, and I think the harder work right now in, in our community is to, is to, really, to really interrogate intentionality. Um, I don't find that if 
somebody doesn't want to buy, like as is the case with some Israelis, if somebody doesn't want to buy wine or olives from the West Bank, that I now have to think of them as having crossed a boundary of legitimacy. I think that all that winds up doing is narrowing and shrinking the band of people who we identify as part of our people. And I think part of the work of, of peoplehood and pluralism is even including, um, in, especially individuals, we could talk differently about movements and organizations, but really thinking about individuals with whom we have significant ideological difference and sometimes even significant political difference in terms of playing out that ideology. The harder work is to not invalidate those who we disagree with, and it's too easy to do it the other way around. Let me, um, let me open up for, uh, for questions from the audience. Um, yes, Jim. Knowing something of Israelis, uh, my sense is that they would respond by saying, well, to hell with them. They were fair weather friends to begin with, and this just confirms it. I want to see the GA come in very large numbers with families and go to the wall. That's, that's something that would make an impression uh, on Israelis. But I'd like to take this opportunity as a panelist to respond to the moderator. <laughs> No? We've gone on to the next thing. Someone else can ask about it again <laughs> later. Somebody please ask that question and then we'll uh, I, Look, I also want to suggest that there's another strategy, which is not just not showing up, but if you're already directing philanthropic resources to this country, designate them. Right? So if you want, you know, the GAs too have, cho GAs have a choice in terms of who are the speakers they profile, what are the issues they, t they take on. American Jews have tremendous economic leverage in terms of their philanthropic dollars, but they tend, when they send it to Israeli institutions, to not correlate between their value systems, which are um, very much about democracy and civil rights and human rights and religious pluralism. They tend to direct them towards institutions that don't always exhibit those things. And, and there is a, a massive gap in the philanthropic investment between the American Jewish value system and American Jewish dollars in Israel. So another way to exercise economic leverage is through the dollars as opposed to, to withholding them. Um, can, I just, can I just respond to Joey for a second? Very, I hear you, I agree with you, and I'm sad. I'm sad that this is the conversation. And I would ask you, what do we need to do to not hurt the tour operator. That some, somehow, I hear you. It just. But part of the problem is that the tour operator. I appreciate. Doesn't I, care about the interests and the wants and the loves and the desires of Jews outside Israel. I know so we have to find a way, and this is some. And again, I appreciate it. I'm saddened by it. And I'm not satisfied, and I know we don't have another language yet, but we need to find one. And it's not a 20-year educational plan. There has to be something else. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen of the iEngage team, we're going to be talking about this. <laughs> there, has to be, there has to be another something which dances that's not so subtle. We need more language, because when we speak it, I understand. But there's a consequence, especially also when we understand that it's not that North American Jewry and Israeli Jewry are so committed to each other. And it's not that each one is inevitably going to end up. So like, you know, the, this party could fight with this party because we know in another three years you're going to make up because you're going to need each other. 
right now, both within Israel and North America. And I know over the last few days you spoke about Israelis and Palestinians. In Israelis and North American Jews, there is a very, very viable option to simply ignore each other in the long term. And be careful, because Humpty Dumpty could fall and we might not be able to put it back together again. And therefore, that which is meant to build has to make sure that it doesn't destroy. And again, what to do, I don't know. But I would, when you say what, only thing I would add is when you say it, end it with a question mark. I don't, I don't remember. Could you, uh, <coughs> could you repeat it? I suspect it had uh, something to do with uh, uh, boycotts uh, based on occupation. Ah, right. The, um, <laughs> the, um, I, I, I just want to emphasize a distinction between personal boycotts and organized boycotts. When you said that we shouldn't be delegitimizing someone who doesn't want to buy products from settlements, well, that's, that's, that's obvious to me. But when you turn that into a, a commitment, into a platform, uh, that's, where, that's where I have trouble. The one thing I'll say is um, the one thing I'll say is that there is actually a very prominent uh, religious Zionist rabbi who actually left Likud over this conversion bill. So I think what's happening is a lot of people are getting angered at the same time. I don't know how they're related, except that they're both related to religion and state. Um, but we can talk more about that after. Uh, one one other way in which it's related is that um, is that it shows us this is not only about uh, the relationship between American Jews um, and Israel. Uh, there is a conflict in Israel about who gets to determine certain decisions that relate to personal status and religion on the government level. So right now, the decision to really uh, give a monopoly over conversions to the Haredi rabbinate, which is in essence uh, a slap in the face to many religious Zionist rabbis particularly who have been trying to have new systems in order to accommodate the thousands of, uh, uh, of children born every year uh, who are not able to go through the conversion through the Haredi rabbinate because of different reasons. Uh, so it's, it shows us that it's a deeper, not a deeper, but that it's a little bit of a wider rift. That it's, that yes, part of it is what happens with our denominations and North American Jewry. Uh, and Israel, but there's definitely important uh, Israeli elements within it. Even more surprisingly is that about the, like Naftali Bennett's party, um, you know, supported this in essence. And many of the rabbis who are involved in conversion come uh, from their constituency. So it, it's important for me to follow this development as well. I'm not sure what the reaction on that side is going to be besides for speaking strongly against it and condemnation. And maybe uh, I'll, I'll relate to what Ilana said earlier, we have to think about alliances. Uh, what does it mean to form alliances with unlikely partners who might be fighting for different sort of, um, of purposes, but through the same conflict of who gets to determine and have power over the religious and really the Jewish nature of the state of Israel? Um, 
Very interesting question. Yes, it will snowball, um, but you have to understand why this is happening in Israeli society today. Um, in a normal coalition system, there is a ruling party. And the ruling party is the one who's supposed to be the adult in the room. Their job is to look out for the well-being of the country. Coalition partners to the ruling party join the coalition on the basis of an agreed platform. And every coalition partner knows that they're not going to get everything that they want. The job of the coalition partners in the Israeli political system is to represent their constituency. That's their job. And to bring the needs of their constituency to a cabinet which cares about the issues of the country. And this is an internal check and balance. So instead of, that's the check and balance. No ruling party has a pure majority. And therefore, the ruling party worries about the country personal, individual votes, even though you don't have local representation, you have tribal representation, tribal representation gets 10, 15, 25, 50 percent of their interests. And that's the coalition dance. Now please remember, the Haredi parties today have no option to leave this coalition. So in fact, they really aren't even threatening Netanyahu. Because if there would be a new election, let's say it would leave, there'd be a new election. The only thing that could possibly change would be for it to be worse for the Haredi. Nothing will Yair Lapid get a... See, right now all the shifts that take place are taking place within the blocks. This has been happening over the last 10 years. The blocks have stayed the same and the Haredim are preferring to have, have a natural preference to join the right-wing bloc instead of the Yair Lapid bloc. The only, th it'll probably be the exact same thing, in which case they'll join the coalition under the same conditions again, unless we'll just be permanently up for elections. Or Yair Lapid will succeed in getting five seats from the right-wing bloc. The minute he does that, he could build a coalition without the Haredim or with one of them. So they have no, they, they don't even have any leverage on Netanyahu. Ah, so then what's happening? What's happening is they don't need leverage right now. Because the way Israel is functioning is there is no adult in the room when it comes to anything pertaining to inside the borders of the State of Israel. As I wrote, I believe Netanyahu holds the position that he is Israel's greatest security asset. And if he is prime minister, Israel is, it will, will be able to navigate these treacherous times. And consequently, he has given up any pretense, even, of ruling within the country. And is allowing the various coalition partners, and this is, the, this is the difficulty, and that's why your position and how you respond is so critical. Each tribe basically gets to determine on their issues what the whole country should do without anybody saying what is the interest of the country. So one group is now getting to decide who the Supreme Court judges should be. Someone else is going to get to decide, should we have in the Knesset a legislation which bypasses the Supreme Court so that the Supreme Court can overrule? Another group could decide whether we right now should over... These are, these, this is, it's not just the Haredi snowballing. You have to see this in the context of a whole slew of legislations that have been snowballing over the last two years including Amona was one of them, where Israel overturned a policy since 67, never to build on private held land. That was Israeli policy. We don't need to build on privately held land in order to sustain a claim to Judea and Samaria, in order to support the settler movement. There's only 3,000 houses on privately held land. Yet, at the push of one of the tribes, we passed a legislation permitting for the first time building on privately held land under certain conditions, causing Benny Begin to stand up at the Knesset and to say, Israel today has legitimized theft. And Benny Begin is a one-statist and a right-wing. So each tribe now is pushing. And the way the government is functioning is that as long as you keep the prime minister in power, 
we are dealing with the larger, most critical strategic interests, and each and and there is no corrective. So the Haredim will continue, and and every single part, every single tribe which speaks powerfully enough, will push and push, and there will be no um, nothing to stop unless, and this is why the Kotel was different. Unless there's another tribe which comes in, which 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 enters the conversation. So what's remarkable is that the religious Zionists, as Michal said, didn't come up and say one second, we don't want we're a counter tribe to the ultra Orthodox. No, because the religious Zionist community has become just like Netanyahu, a foreign policy party instead of an internal policy party. So until we don't have counter tribes pushing against each other, we can't count right now on the existence of a mature adult. If that's the case, we have to ask ourselves, how do you function in this environment? Do not assume that there is a mature adult in the room. And if you don't make that assumption, then a lot of other decisions um, have to be put on the table because you don't, when there's a mature adult, you could speak about national interests. You could speak about what's good for the country. You can make a reasonable argument. Now, when you don't have that, it's part of what creates the chaos and the dangerous reality that we're facing right now. So I'm, I'm not naive enough to suggest that we should try to make all of these different tribes into the adults in the room. That I think would be political naivete. Though, I think it would be fantastic. What I do want to say is that I'm a little itchy, um, which is when we keep saying the Haredim, the Haredim, the Haredim, there is no group of people who is one monolith. There is no group of people who is one monolith. The people in this room are not one monolith. So one thing I do want to ask us is how do we sow the seeds of opposition within the Haredi party, within the Haredi tribe? The same way, how do we sow the seeds of opposition within secular Israelis? How do we sow the seed of opposition within religious Zionism? Sowing the seeds of opposition is what actually makes a space nuanced. So I just want to put that on the table as, as this is rising to think about in addition to how this fits in, you know, to that incredible cosmology that Danielle was able to give us, which I learned a lot from listening to. Also just thinking about the identity of those tribes and to try to gentrify them in some way. would be, this is just a guess. Uh, are you talking about Masorti, like yes. conservative, conservative reform? In other words, that... Right, why has this not become, why has that pers demographically not become as significant in terms of being able to advance its agenda over, for instance, the gay community in Israel, which has been politically successful in advancing its agenda compared to forces that are trying to, to repress it. I, my guess would be, just a guess, um, that the, the, the components of the agenda that you described as the Masorti agenda, which relate to religion and personal status and so forth, 
um, get subdivided and balkanized because all those people don't all agree with respect to political and security issues. And if you ultimately have to decide on who you're voting for, you're going to wind up divide, subdividing within that community between right-wing and left-wing political parties. And as a result, instead of being thought of as a dominant interest group that's capable of organizing politically, it's been a subdivided interest group. But if um, I think the um, there is a clear majority of Israelis who want Israel to be a modern democracy. Where they disagree as to what it is that they need to do in order for Israel to be a modern democracy. One of the great successes of the gay uh, um, lesbian community is that it's not just in Israel, is that internationally, this is one of the great tests to whether you embrace modernity or not. Are you a modern country? It became the test. There were, there's various issues which from time to time, and similarly in the United States on issues of marriage, they became, they become flashpoint. This is, are you in the 21st century or not? Israelis want to be in the 21st century. They don't see issues of religious diversity as critical for them being in the 21st century because they want, too many of them want freedom from religion, not freedom of religion. And until Israelis understand that freedom of religion is necessary for being a modern country in the 21st century, they're not going to give the tacit support, which the gay lesbian community has, um, from large segments of Israeli society. That going back is, is an educational process, um, which, is, which, which we haven't yet been successful at. Yeah, I'll share something that's still a thought in progress. Um, Nancy, I share the question that you have but with regards to the Orthodox community in North America. In the sense that of my observation of the modern Orthodox community, there's been much faster uh, and greater uh, acceptance uh, of, of the gay community within it than of uh, feminism or, or feminist Orthodoxy. So I'm still thinking about the implications. I don't want to give the interpretation now because I'm still thinking about it. But there's something about um, gender and about feminism that's uh, become uh, a boundary uh, in a way that the gay community doesn't represent the same sort of boundary and boundary crossing. So uh, I'm not sure exactly the implications or, or why this is, but I think this same question could be applied there as well, and, and we see here another manifestation of that. I think that uh, there's also, the, the from the perspective of the Haredi leadership, uh, they're very adept at assessing the mood in the general Israeli public. And I think they understood that the that gay pride was an issue which they initially opposed. They initially opposed the parade and then realized they can't win that argument. And they choose their battles. And uh, on, on religion uh, and state, that for them is, is, is a red line, not only because it's a red line in terms of their values, but also, as, as Daniil said, because the, the, it isn't enough of a significant issue for a majority of Israelis. I think there's also a, a wider point to be made, which goes back to the question that someone asked earlier about, uh, is, this a, is this a symptom of rising Haredi power? I think there's another way of looking at it, which is that the Haredi community is very much on the defensive now. And they're on the defensive on multiple fronts. And that's not the perception that one gets abroad. But within the Haredi community, there is a sense that, that their position is eroding. Uh, they're losing more and more of their young people. And if you look at the numbers of Knesset representation, it's actually, it's gone down. Uh, a couple of Knessets ago, the Haredim had uh, something like a qu uh, approaching a quarter of the representation. And that was because Shas, the Sfaradi Haredi party, had managed to, to, to attract, he had won 17 seats, and it managed to attract a large number of non-Haredi working class Mizrahim. That's changed. Shas is now back to its more or less natural dimensions of support from within the Orthodox uh, Sfaradi community. And so the, the Haredi leadership is looking at a very uncertain future. More and more of their young people are joining the workforce. Uh, there is some movement of young Haredim joining the army. And so 
they are really uh, very much uh, looking at their relationship with the, to Israeli society, not only from the position of flexing their muscles, but from what are the minimal red lines that they can sustain. thing that North American Jews have to ask themselves. Are you going to persevere? Because if you're going to be short, you're going to make a lot of noise for a short period of time, it's going to be gone. And that's what happened there. And whether you have the long breath, this is a marathon. And it's not about one meeting. Um, and that's one of the things we learned. They weren't able, they burnt out too quickly. And they weren't able to sustain um, the concentration, the focus on this issue. I do believe that for North American Jews, this issue is sustainable. How you act in a sustainable long-term way will make, um, will make all the difference. And it's also worth, just in that example, you know, in retrospect, I, I, I mean no disrespect to the per this person involved, but the, one of the successes of the Cottage Cheese March was that one of its leaders became a Knesset member for one of the main parties, younger than anybody else in the Knesset. And, um, and oftentimes these political movements have to ask, what is, what's your desired outcome? Is it, the co is it this particular cause or is it at the advancement? And sometimes they may look like they're similar, that advancing particular individuals associated with the cause into the system actually benefits the cause. And in this case, it seems to have benefited uh, you know, some of the individuals involved, but that the cause has not remained front and center. And there are probably other environmental factors um, for why that's been the case. It will still be worthwhile asking that question 10 years from now. And it's possible that by having the leader of that movement in the Knesset, you will actually see significant change through the system. But I think, I think to, map, to map it back on the Kotel question, do you want the leaders of the Kotel protests to become more significant in Israeli society, or do you want a long arc momentum on this issue, which may not be rewarded politically quite the same way, but might sustain the pressure differently? And I would just add one thing to that, only because I had the opportunity to speak to MK Stav Shafir earlier in the year. And what she talked about was the need for structural change. And I think when you have someone who's on the inside, who has your interests at heart, they can help make structural change. And I think in many ways, the conversations that we have about how do you, even how do you exert force, you have to have someone or people on the inside who are going to be part of creating the structural adaptive change that can allow for the technical fix that it looks like right now, but it's really a big adaptive change. So that's something that I think we need to think about when we make alliances and really uh, an entire effort here would include insiders and us, right? And who are those insiders?
Okay, that's uh, the question relates to the fact that the panel so far has operated mostly on conflicts within Ju within the Jewish people, and that one of the themes throughout the week, especially last night, is between um, Israeli Jews and Palestinians, and that hasn't been fully addressed here. It was certainly surfaced in the in the Settler panel last night, and our thoughts in in terms of bringing together the the study we've been doing this week about what's I guess what's next, or um, or how do we hold this um, this this issue in tension, and how do we think about it? Yeah, from some of the responses that I got to the panel uh, last night from, from the audience, uh, I came to realize that what was important about the panel wasn't necessarily what was said, but the fact that it happened. Uh, a number of people have said uh, to the effect that this was the first time that they'd heard a settler. And I, I found that very disturbing. Uh, this is an argument that's been going on for decades. And how is it that, that settlers who are, who are not shy about, about conveying their opinions and seeking, seeking platforms uh, are, um, are, are so inaccessible to, to very involved American Jews? And when, um, when I speak in the States to, um, to Orthodox communities, uh, what I say to them is go visit in Arab-Israeli village. And when I speak to liberal Jewish communities, I say, go visit a settlement. And so what I would, what I would hope uh, came out of last night's panel was um, some unease, some sense of stepping out of one's, one's comfort zone and uh, being able and willing to listen to some very difficult opinions for, for many of you, perhaps offensive opinions, but that certainly works both ways, and I think we need to be, to be able to sustain a, a conversation that is broad and that really can, can contain all of the different forms of commitments and visions and fears that, that we're holding as a people. You know, I think one of the, one of the, one of the tensions that I feel this institution holds, one of the things that I think about a lot in our programs and in our content is around um, how much are people coming here to learn in order to think radically differently about these issues, in other words, for their opinions to change, and how much is it about being able to inhabit a space where you're not being asked for your opinions to change, but you're asking um, to be in a place in which there is more data in which you are interrogating the very opinions that you already don't agree with, in which you're engaging with the ideas. I said this to my small breakout group yesterday. You're engaging with ideas that you disagree with in order to be able to grant them a limud schut, which is to say a more credible understanding of that which you disagree with so that your disagreement with it can be more refined and more effective. Um, I find that um, the reason I'm thinking about this out loud is because I don't want that second goal to feel like it is a less loft, lofty educational objective than I think most education, which is trying to get people to change their mind. Um, I think it's in and of itself a significant educational goal. I think one of the things that happens in a program like this is that people will then say, where, where were the people who I agreed with? Right? Or I'm, I'm aggrieved because the things that I wanted to hear, or more likely, the opinions that I wanted other people to hear so that they could agree with me, um, were not there, which is a means of mapping the educational responsibility for what's supposed to happen onto the program or onto other people as opposed to onto oneself. So I, I don't feel personally that I agree politically with either of the speakers who was here last night. Um, but when we designed that program, the challenge was, can we find a couple of people who can authentically represent a series of viewpoints that if you want to really engage with settlers and settlements, you got to hear that viewpoint instead of painting and characterizing and, and most likely caricaturing the viewpoints um, on, the, on the basis of your political opinions. And if you can hold that and create that cognitive dissonance and, and be in it, then that's a powerful experience. It actually hopefully correlates to some of the cognitive dissonances that Israelis experience and the tension between the values that they have to live with very imminently. But it is a very hard thing to do educationally because almost by definition, we're gonna to wanna to gravitate towards 
the positions we agree with and therefore are looking for ways in which those positions can be expressed to demonstrate that they are the rightest. Um, and that's a hard thing to do. I have to, my favorite anecdote of the week is I was in a, I was in a session and someone said, I went to Shiloh and I was so scared. And I said, what were you afraid of? She said, I identified with the person who was speaking. <laughs> it was an amazing moment. And I said, how did you get yourself back to your particular political leaning? She said, well, I identify with what I think also. And that, I think, is, is remarkable about what we tried to do last night. You may have wanted Palestinian voices. That's a different conversation. But the idea of actually being able to hear something that, that I mean, it was unbelievable. She was Rav Tzvi Yehuda Cook sitting on the stage. You asked her, would you ever leave, even for peace? She said, no. You asked her, would you ever compromise an inch? No. And it was amazing. We should all have such passion for Jewish peoplehood and the Jewish state. Maybe, to my mind, not such black and white conviction, but we should all have such passion. So how do we experience that? How do we experience, let alone those who agree, how do we experience that? Um, so, so I think another, another question that I've been having in my mind that for me uh, relates to the um, different classes that we had throughout the week and, and also here right now has to do with, um, like with the application, right? Like what do we do right now? And, and we heard that in nearly every session and I heard both a desire to know how to make things better and also from some people and myself at some points you know, internally like a sort of like um, refusal to believe that we are hopeless and we cannot change something or make it better. Um, so the one thing that I've been uh, thinking uh, a lot about, it, and I'll speak personally here, is that perhaps uh, there have been points where I've had too much of um, like messianic Zionism. Let me explain what I mean for in a second. Uh, I think we, we, we distinguish sometimes a diasporic existence in which we were powerless and couldn't do certain things, and sometimes we talk about Zionism as the, as the ability to have like absolute agency and really shape history and not only let it happen to us. So what's been so hard for me is to sit in this space in which there are some things that I can shape, but there are some things where I don't see any way that I can affect the reality and the experience around me. So one question that I'm taking with me is what does it mean to live in this moment in which uh, part of the Zionist premise of being able to, change, uh, to affect change and shape history has definitely happened, but, but we don't have that full Zionist redemption yet. Uh, in terms of being able to affect everything. And for me, this question is not only ideological, but it's very pragmatic. It's, you know, maybe take a little bit of control of the situation and assess where can I make change? Where am I going to put all of my resources? What am I willing to fight for? What's going to be my battle? And where are some areas where it's perhaps, uh, perhaps I won't be able to be successful? No, they're not important, but that I'm going to be more strategic in being able to move forward. I've spent many years trying to see if we could reach a consensus on our political positions. 
and um, I, I personally and a lot of other of us have been a total failure. Um, and part of what I've realized over time is that that agenda was a mistake. Could we create a silent majority around certain political platforms? The realities that we face are so complicated and the ideologies that we bring to the table are so diverse that to assume that we're going to have a similar or shared political agenda <coughs> is just is, is false. Good people, smart people, intelligent people are going to have different positions on whether Judea and Samaria is Judea and Samaria or, or the West Bank and what to do about it. <clears throat> so I've shifted, both personally and institutionally, our agenda. <clears throat> and I know, Michal, this is the ideology behind the class that you taught. Um, the new I Engage for curriculum, which you've experienced, um, and which is now coming out um, as we speak, is the first curriculum in the Hartman Institute that doesn't assume the two-state solution as the only intelligent, plausible solution for the state of Israel. Um, up till now, I engage one, two, and three was meant for those people who shared the two-state solution. I engage four does not make that assumption. <clears throat> it assumes that one statism is both part of the conversation and can be both as intellectually and morally plausible as a two-state solution even though I might have one position which might be different, we are no longer positing that enlightenment is inhabited in the two-state solution. We stopped doing that institutionally and in our curriculum. But what we are, that is, an un, is to create a schism in the Jewish people, is to determine somebody as outside the parameters of moral and intelligent discourse that we feel just is, is not correct. What the front lines of what we're trying to do now institutionally is to instead of create, <coughs> trying to create a political consensus, to try to create a moral consensus. And while you might assume that that is simple, I can't tell you how difficult that challenge is right now. Certain core, as Michal taught, what are the core moral principles if you're a two-statist or you're a one-statist, what is it that you hold? Where do you stand? Can we create a community that disagrees about politics but shares our values? Right now, that's the biggest divide. The politics are minor. They're really minor, especially in the context of the political discussions that you've been exposed to and Micha and others. It's not that tomorrow, even if you wanted to, there's something that you could do to bring about a two-state solution. In the short run, we have to reclaim a, what is it, what, 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 how do Jews do politics? What, you, you, you remember that phenomenal um, op-ed article by um, John McCain? Like, what, where, where are our values? or when Tal Becker comes back from the various places that Tal comes from and he can't tell us about, but he could just tell us he was there. <laughs> you know, I was there. Where? I was at the place that I can't tell you. <laughs> no, and he says that very rarely in those spheres is somebody asking, what is Jewishly required to do? How do we, cre how do we recreate within our people a very strong moral commitment to key principles and have that conversation. And so when you think about last night, when you think about the frustration, that frustration is a given because there's, some, there's such deep, deep disagreements about what's best for Israel, what's best for Palestinians, and yes, what's best and plausible in the Middle East. And the only thing, and I've said this before, and it's, a, it's it's worthwhile restating over and over again, and I try to restate it, is, is that to remember what Socrates taught when he finally discovered that he was the most intelligent of human beings because he was the only one who knew that he didn't know. 
that there's, there's that certainty in politics over conviction and, and political certainty in politics, I don't think is a great virtue. There's such a mess right now. Yeah, I have an opinion. And I don't even know if I agree with my opinion, but I have an opinion. But when it comes to moral principles, let's start, let's, let's, you know, I, I wrote an article in the Times of Israel a while ago, you know, let the debate about the settlements begin. Yeah, let the debate around our moral principles begin. Because we're not there. We're not there in Israel, we're not there in North America, and we're not there with each other. And a community which has that, you talk about a, uh, it's not that we don't boycott each other. It's when we sense that there really is something that we share with each other across our political lines, that I could respect you because I see within you a similar value agenda, even though you might translate it politically differently, that becomes, I believe that that is one of the more critical educational challenges that we have to work on. But to achieve that, we need a much higher level of discourse, as well as a higher level of educational leadership to engage in. Because it's one thing when you assume that everybody agrees with you. And when you assume that everybody agrees with you, all I have to do to get you to be with me is just, there's something blocking your vision. I just have to move it and then you'll be with me. But when you internalize the fact that we are so profoundly different, that we're gonna have to create and engage in far more sophisticated um, educational endeavors and whether we have the educational leadership to do so is, is a question. But that's, that's the next challenge of the Jewish people. Not an agreed upon foreign policy, but an agreed upon moral principle standard of what it means to be a Jew in the modern world. I'm gonna end on that. I wanna thank our, uh, my fellow panelists. I, um, I just wanna convey my appreciation I want to convey my appreciation to all of you for, uh, for enriching this Bay Midrash with your openness, with your learning, with the questions, and, um, and we'll have more to say, uh, we'll have more to say uh, over lunch, but, um, but for our last time in the Bay Midrash and before we fill out the evaluations, our sincere thanks for, for making this not just a place of books, but, but really a place of people.